Thank you for coming to our session. I'm sure, like us, it's the end of quite a busy week for you. I'm impressed to see so many people still at the conference on Friday. Um, so we appreciate you coming along. Um, We'll start with some introductions. I'm Mike Mayer. I'm from uh, Pearson. I head up the Global Scale of English, which is a, if you like, an extension of the Common European Framework. So we've developed more uh, can-do statements to flesh out certain areas, and one of those areas is professional English, so English for the workplace. And I'm joined today by Tim, I don't know if you want to shout out who you are. Um, I'm the head of academic development at Eurocenters and through Eurocenters Consultancy to the Council of Europe. I'm a member of the co-authoring group for the recent companion volume to the CFR. Yeah, so today um, Tim and I are going to be looking at research that we've carried out, that other people have carried out into employability in the future and the skills that employers are looking for, and then to talk to you a little bit about some of the tools and resources that we've developed to support you as teachers who are working with those uh, future employees. So, if we start with what are employees looking for today? And back in about 2014-15, Pearson carried out some research with LinkedIn and we were looking at, you know, the importance of English in the workplace and, and, um, and these were some of the findings. So of the top five attributes that people were looking for in their employees, fluency in English was the second um, attribute that they, uh, they expressed in the questionnaire. And Around 68%, well, not around, exactly 68% of, uh, of the respondents said that they, uh, they assessed the proficiency of their employees for English. And over 90% said that they did feel that it was beneficial on their profitability um, if they had a workforce that was competent in English. Which one, sorry? Well, you mentioned that um, fluency in English was the second. The, the top one was, um, if you can read that, uh, okay. It's uh, Re relevant skill set, so their job specific knowledge. Yeah, sorry, I thought the slide might have been a bit clearer than that. Um, so, another piece of research that you might be familiar with was published by the British Council last year, and that was into the future of English in Europe in 2025. And, well, the good news is that English will still be uh, needed in 2025, so we can all relax a little bit. Um, I think there were some interesting findings in there, if you can read the bottom bullet, that actually the demand for the evening course and the weekend course that goes over a long period of time their survey suggests that that is going to actually die out and what people will be looking for are very precise, shorter, very targeted courses and with a very specific goal in mind. And some of those very specific goals are linked to employment. So they will be looking for, I think they call it top-up tuition to address some of their language needs for the workplace. And so with so many industries um, around the world using increasingly English as their, their language at work, we set about developing this set of learning objectives for English for the workplace. So if you're not familiar with the global scale of English, please go away and um, explore the website. This is all free, by the way. I'm from Pearson, but we're not selling anything to you. So you can go to the website, english.com, quite easy to remember. All of this is downloadable. Um, so we've developed a set of learning objectives for professional English. If you can see the screen, if it's clear enough, um, you'll recognize the format. These are can-do statements, very much like the Common European Framework. Um, but this is fleshing out that area of English for the workplace. So even though Common European Framework has the workplace as one of its domains, 
the amount of information specific to professional English is quite limited. So we've, we've built out a full set of learning objectives to help you if you're teaching um, students for in business English to plan curricula, um, plan your lessons. Um, and as I said, this report was really um, stressing that uh, going forward there will be these shorter, quite targeted top-up courses focusing on like, business skills, and you can see some of them there, attending meetings, negotiating, etc. And so what we did with our set of learning objectives was to add this as a search function in our database. And again, you can find this at english.com, freely accessible. All of our learning objectives are in there, including the professional ones. And if you s click on select a skill, in addition to just reading, listening, reading, writing, you can now select one of those business skills. So for example, meetings, attending meetings, running meetings, taking notes in meetings. And you will just be given a, a list of those language functions which are relevant to teach, maybe in that short top-up course, relevant to attending or running meetings. So we've taken the hard work for you going through and searching for them. You can just click on that search function and you'll get that set of learning objectives. So then we thought, okay, that's great. That's specific skills. What about for specific jobs? So then we went and looked at um, a database known as the ONET database. You might be familiar with it. Again, freely available online. Um, it's a US database. It, uh, database. it lists every job you will ever have heard of, I guarantee. The jobs in there, I have no idea what they are. And we looked at the tasks that people would be required to do for that job and then looked at mapping language, language skills to those tasks. So if you had to do this job in English, this is something you would have to do. What language would you need to be able to do it successfully in English? So for example, nurses, you go into the database and it lists all the things that a nurse might be expected to do. And we took that list and we then mapped it to one or more language functions that would help you to do that in English. Again, it's not very, very difficult to do, but it's a bit time consuming. And so we've now added this to the toolkit again. Now you can click on choose a job role and it will allow you to search by sectors of industry and specific job roles and again you will get a list of learning objectives specific to that particular profession so again if it's a short course you can't teach them the whole of the English language in that time so here's a set that you can demonstrate to them that these will have direct application in your work so 2025 now let's move to 2030 and um, Pearson's just published some research about what employers will be looking for in 2030. And back in 2015, an interesting statistic, 65% um, of 12-year-olds will end up doing a job that doesn't exist today. Okay, so if you think back to when you were 12 and what you wanted to do when you left school, um, certainly, if you're of my generation, you didn't even think about being a drone operator or, you know, a Zumba instructor because that didn't exist when I was 12 years old. And so we're looking less, I think, at the particular knowledge of a particular subject and more at these skills. And so the Pearson research focuses on these skills. And again, you can go if you the, the website futureskillspearson.com, and you'll find this website which lists out these future skills that employers say they are looking for. It's also very nice because it's quite interactive, and you can type in your age and your job, and it will tell you 
how likely it is that your job will be growing in 2030, or whether or not it will be declining in 2030. Okay? Um, so, spoiler alert, it's good news. As language teachers, you're still going to have a job in 2030. Okay? So that's the go. Well, I won't. I'll be on a beach somewhere. But you, you young people can carry on teaching past 2030 because that is one of the growth sectors. The more manual sectors, no surprise, they are in decline. And as I was looking at this list, I'm thinking, actually, it kind of looks familiar. Isn't this something that we've been talking about, certainly in language teaching, for quite a while? looks like a lot like the 21st century skills, which are now, I think, maybe referred to as the soft skills or the personal and social capabilities, a different name, but actually they're, they're pretty similar, right? And my feeling is, as language teachers, we're in a really strong position to at least allow our students to practice these skills. Um, I love this quote. Again, this is another piece of research from somebody who's looking at new um, models, new uh, teaching models. And if you can read that, if this doesn't whet your appetite, I don't know what does, but the teachers, the students, and the radically disruptive nuns who are leading a global uh, learning movement. So, if, you know, if radically disruptive nuns doesn't get you looking for this on the internet, I don't know what will. Um, and these are, these are teachers around the world who are experimenting with new models. And the conclusions that Charles Ledbetter is coming to is actually, in an age of robots, we don't want to have an education system which is basically training our kids to be second-rate robots. They don't, we don't need to train them in the things that robots can do really well. But actually... We need to train them to be more human. Focus on the things that humans can do, which at least at the moment, and by 2030 still, computers and robots are probably not going to be able to do as well as humans. And so, you know, as I said, with the 21st century skills, I think we do that. I mean, certainly as a publisher, as course book publishers, we're thinking about critical thinking, collaboration, communication. We're building that into our courses. But as I've thought about this a bit more, it strikes me that maybe we are giving them opportunities to practice these skills. But are we actually, well, teaching maybe is... You know, maybe that's not strictly your job as language teachers, but are we at least crediting them for doing the communication or the collaboration well? Are we raising awareness to say, this task is not just about, you know, getting the grammar right, the vocabulary right, getting your meaning across, but how do you do it? Just raise the awareness of how you're doing it. And I think it's quite common amongst language teachers to set success criteria for your lessons. And, you know, understandably, they're probably focused on the, the language objectives of, you know, did you reuse the, the vocabulary, the grammar that we've been practicing in this class? But maybe we could just take that one step further and actually establish success criteria for these softer skills. So actually, in a group work, is there... Did you see evidence of active listening? Did you see collaboration? Did people invite others into the conversation? Okay, and if you do this as a, like a checklist for the students themselves, then they can be looking out for it. And I think just raising that awareness in the classroom around these soft skills, that's already taking us a little step uh, further forward without really too much more effort. And so I'm going to hand over to Tim now, who, as he said, has been working on the new Common European Framework descriptors and creating some more resources to support you as teachers. So, there you go. Thank you, Mike. So in this half of the talk, I'm going to broaden the, the focus on uh, 
what we mean by these transferable soft skills and how uh, instruments like the CFR can help us um, describe these skills in, in terms of su success criteria that are relevant to the language classroom. Um, the CFR, as you know, is the framework on which the GSE is based. And um, for, for to, to summarize this very difficult topic, topic to summarize, uh, I've chosen the word connectedness today um, as, as a way of encapsulating what I think these types of skills are. Um, so I want to ask this question, how can the CFR help educators define and develop skills for connectedness or um, transferable soft skills? Um, as Mike has uh, posited, um, the, the way jobs will change towards 2030 um, is a mixture of jobs being replaced and transformed. Uh, here we see examples of artificial intelligence actually replacing roles. Um, with uh, Sophia here is a service robot who is artificially intelligent, can hold a conversation. Um, Kui Hao on the, on the right hand side is a newsreader who can read the news 24 hours a day because he's not really the real person. He's a re reconstruction of that person. However, he doesn't replace all of the roles of that news channel. There, there will be still the newsreaders on the sofa making jokes to each other and so on. So, so there is more of a blend happening in the future in terms of the way artificial intelligence comes into the workplace and mops up all of the, uh, the low-level tasks, but also the, the uh, pattern recognition tasks in medicine, for example. So um, the, the sort of skill set that will be needed for these jobs that we can't yet visualize of course, will be transferable skills that um, involve the human side of communication and collaboration. And uh, this extract from a report by uh, McKinsey Global Institute um, emphasizes how there is uh, an anticipation of change in working hours towards advanced communication negotiation skills, interpersonal skills and empathy, leadership, managing others. But when you look down a list like this, it's very difficult to think, oh, well, how can you therefore turn this into um, tangible teaching and learning in the classroom? Because a lot of them read like um, character, character traits, personality traits. And um, there are projects to look at this. Uh, Pearson collaborated on this particular project, which is uh, a framework for 21st century skills um, uh, that was developed in the US for, for um, uh, the uh, primary sector and, and secondary sector. But you have as the uh, keystone there the four C's that Mike mentioned. Uh, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And uh, there's definitely uh, a, a discourse about this in the thinking for what the uh, top ten skills, for example, for uh, 2020 would be for employability. Critical thinking and creativity have jumped in there at number two and three. But I would argue that the other two, uh, communication and collaboration, are transversal to all of these employability skills. Because to be able to think critically, to be able to uh, be creative and, and solve complex problems, you need to be able to communicate your ideas and collaborate with others. And uh, this can be seen in a concrete way, in teamwork that might be uh, international, online, presentation and leadership to get ideas across, peer learning support. In MOOCs now, massive open online courses, the type of peer feedback that's happening online is, of course, a lot more in-depth and more meaningful than the kind of platitudes you see on social media. And uh, online transactions and discussion uh, are two dimensions of online interaction that are now described in detail in the Common European Framework of Reference. So what is the CFR? It is uh, a descriptive, not a prescriptive scheme. It's a catalogue, actually, of uh, uh, can-do descriptors at each level, that, uh, each reference level that it gives from A1 to C2. Um, you are entitled to pick and mix from those for, for what you see as relevant to your learners as possible learning objectives and outcomes. And it's based on an idea of an action-oriented approach, which um, goes a step beyond the communicative and task-based uh, approach to really think about scenarios and the socio-cultural con context of communication. Um, so the other thing to point out that is that it is applicable across different languages, and the GSE is an example of a, an elaboration into English 
of, of these, these principles. But um, we, we've talked about success criteria, and uh, this is a good metaphor, uh, the, the parable of the blindfold men and the uh, elephant. Uh, what does success look like? Is it, uh, you know, control of forms, grammar and lexis? Is it control of uh, phonology? Is it task achievement? It's all of these things. And the CFR seeks to uh, provide a, a framework that can accommodate all these things with um, a scheme that is, goes beyond the four skills, in fact. We, we, we're used to talking about listening, reading, speaking and writing. But in the CFR, the, the receptive skills of listening and reading are one area that then uh, moves into production and interaction and mediation. Mediation is the category that has been really fleshed out in the, in the latest work, in the companion volume, which I'm just about to introduce. But um, that's where the communication and collaboration happens, from producing the language, responding, interacting, and then actually uh, managing that communication and getting ideas across, helping others understand. And it, this doesn't um, leave out the need for a focus on form uh, and forms and language resources, grammar, lexis and phonology is what we provide as teachers when we elaborate the CFR into context and, and for a particular language, such as with uh, what, what has happened with the GSE project. So um, this volume that was, um, the, the companion volume to the CFR was published online last year and is freely available. Uh, it uh, has been updated to as I say, give descriptors for mediation, but also online interaction, plurilingual and pluricultural skills. And it really uh, emphasizes the fact that this can scaffold teaching and learning as well as assessment. It's not just an assessment framework. Um, so uh, a way of uh, underlining that is the, is the concept of constructive alignment. Um, what, what are the aims you set? What are you planning to do with your learners? How do you turn that into activities in the classroom, the lesson objectives? And then what are the outcomes of learning that you assess? And if you can have coherence between these three things, uh, then you have constructive alignment. And that's very easy to do with focus on forms, with grammar and lexis, because uh, I'm going to teach this grammar point, we will practice it, and then I'll see if the learners produce it. But we need ways of accurately describing our success criteria for the other aspects of communication that we're now focusing on. And um, the CFR enables us to do that, to break it down. So if, if you have employer expe expectations, such as the capacity to solve complex problems, which we saw before, outthinking challenges, being diverse team thinkers, then uh, you have scales in the CFR that will tell you what you can reasonably expect of learners at each of the CFR levels, and um, in terms of tasks that you can then uh, elaborate into their particular scenarios. So um, this is the utility of the CFR. It's not a curriculum off the shelf. We do the work of interpreting it. Um, but I would argue that that helps us provide a meaningful stimulus for reflection and action in terms of generating activities in the classroom that are focused on these soft skills, as well as on the mechanics of the language. And uh, learners themselves can engage with this um, if, if you are able to be selective and, and interpret those descriptors in a way that uh, is simple enough for them to digest. Uh, so, for example, at Eurocenters, we, we uh, put a lot of effort into summarizing these for our learners uh, in terms of what we're expecting them to do in these areas of production, interaction, and, and mediation. So production, you can be thinking about the strategies for initiating communication and organizing your message. Then, of course, someone's going to talk back to you <laughs> once you've produced something. So you need to adapt to the communicative demands of uh, that, that may be online communication with messaging, emails, online chat now. And, that, and that, there is a, a blurring of the boundaries between... Uh, spoken and written uh, communication and the, the leveraging of media as well to get your message across. Uh, and then mediation therefore comes in in terms of bringing ideas and information together in new ways to create a powerful message. Um, so uh, it's not just interpreting, it, it's um, leveraging uh, your own viewpoint and taking into account the viewpoints of others. These are not new things. The mediation has been in the CFR since the beginning. 
but now we have very detailed descriptors that have been calibrated uh, statistically with large-scale large surveys like the original work um, and give us useful self-standing tools to set these success criteria. So you can find this work freely online uh, on the Council of Europe website. I think we will share this um, uh, PowerPoint as well if you want to get that address and download it and, and uh, look through it. But as I say, this is uh, complementary to uh, tools like the GSC, which really specifically look at English and break that down with some excellent uh, mapping to jobs, which I was really impressed to see. Um, so uh, yes, I think uh, that's my main message for uh, how to interpret the CFR. It's not prescriptive, it is descriptive. You can mine it for ideas, and those descriptors can also inspire the generation of activities. So, so um, there's a lot I could say about that, but we don't have time. Um, so we could just leave it to the questions now. and then just talk here, that would be much easier, wouldn't it? Sorry, apologies to everybody online who couldn't hear that. Um, and that's completely thrown me. But yes, um, learning languages. We've also done some research with um, an organization called Bilingual Matters. And you know, there, there's a lot of evidence around to show that learning languages does more than giving you another language. It trains the brain in different ways. Um, people who are multilingual, who speak more than one language, are generally, they can focus better, they're better at critical thinking. So there are a lot of additional benefits to, to learning a language. I don't know why there would be an assumption you were going just into teaching. No, and uh, I think that's the point we're making today is that there is a convergence now between uh, a focus on English language skills and a focus on employability skills, the ability to uh, get your point across in different situations, to, to be sensitive to other viewpoints. Um, and these uh, English majors might be moving into roles of uh, training in communication skills, not just teaching in the classroom. It might be that companies need these uh, uh, majors to provide that kind of training. So I think there are lots of opportunities as we, as we see English as a lingua franca becoming um, ever more uh, the, the, uh, um, the need for uh, interaction internationally. Yeah. Thank you. Any more? Uh, okay, let's go right to the back.
Absolutely. In fact, my, my feeling when I read the reports was um, I think this um, message is more relevant for non-language teachers because my memories of learning history and geography were very much, you know, you sat and you listened. And that was it. I'm pretty sure it's changed, changed now since, you know, the Victorian period when I went to school. Um, but, um, and the... The reports, um, Tim mentioned the P21 research, and there are some reports on there around critical thinking, collaboration, uh, communication, etc. Those reports pull together the research, and they're very much targeted at those like science teachers, the maths teachers in higher education where they weren't seeing evidence of, of people being given critical thinking skills and communication. So. I totally agree. I think somebody, this would have to be, thank you for the question, yeah. Um, my question was, what are the limitations of Erasmus? Why do you think that we need to support Yeah, there, there is a case study project that the Council of Europe is leading, um, and uh, um, a number of institutions across Europe have been invited to participate in those case studies and then write up their findings, which includes... Um, the development of assessment instruments uh, and criteria based on the can-do statements in the CFR. Um, I think criterion-based assessment is the, f the place to start with this uh, in terms of performance criteria in activities that give affordances for mediation to happen. Um, and, and this is something we've been doing at Eurocentrism. We will publish a paper on that as well. But I can, tell, I can tell you that, you know, having published this uh, report, Pearson is looking very closely at how you then assess those skills. So there is a lot of investment and a lot of time being spent on creating assessments, not necessarily for English language teaching and learning initially, but it will come, I'm sure. Be patient. Um, I think, well, maybe one more question then. But it is already happening in uh, a number of assessments, but um, uh, do you mean in terms of integration with... Uh, uh, well, for example, when you teach when you Yeah. So th this, this calls for assessments that allow them to demonstrate those skills and uh, using criteria such as the ones we've uh, previewed today to, to uh, acknowledge th that ability and, and certificate it uh, along with uh, the more uh, systems-oriented aspects of language. Um, the, la the ladies just waved the end your session now piece of paper at us. But I would say I think uh, also there it's a case of raising awareness cause, because I seem to remember when I was applying for my first jobs, you scrabbled around to find examples of where you demonstrated leadership or collaboration skills. And I think, you know, if we as teachers can raise awareness where our students are actually acquiring those, again, that, that's a good thing going through. Um, I think we have to leave the room, so thank you very much for your... Thank you.